Well, hey there, Foundry Church. As we dive in today, I'm gonna just get right into it. I wanna ask you a question. When I say the phrase rendered useless, what comes to mind? For me, um, and if you're new here, you don't know this, but I'm a tremendous dork. And um, there's things I like that I think some people are like, what's wrong with you? But Erica and I love the show Survivor. Yeah, it's so good. I like it so much. And on Survivor, there's different things that go on, but basically you're trying to build a social and a physical game that gets you to the end to win a million dollars. And um, they have these things called hidden immunity idols where you cannot be voted out if you play your hidden immunity idols and or hidden immunity idol, hidden immunity idol. And a lot of people will go and they will um, they will search through the jungle and they'll find a hidden immunity idol and they'll keep it and they're really rare and um, and they will um, have their hidden immunity idol on them over 40 over the I think there's been 42 seasons 17 players have been voted out of the game because they didn't play, they've left the game with an active immunity idol in their pocket because you have to play it before the votes are read. It's really fascinating because once the reading of the votes happens, you can't be like, oh wait, I wanna play it. It's, it's rendered useless. And 17 players have been kicked or lo- voted out of the game with active immunity idols in their pocket. It's on their person. And I would say this, in many ways, we do this with wisdom. We have wisdom in our life, don't we? And, and it's, it's an active force in our life and it's rendered useless when we don't employ it. You can read Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University and go deep into debt. You absolutely can do that. You can learn how to um, eat right and and study fitness and just get gigantic eating Oreos and butter and Coke. That sounds like a dark diet right there. That sounds like something's gone wrong. If that's what you, if you're buttering an Oreo, uh, that's not good. But you can you can look at um, all the right information and know what to do and still gain weight. You can buy cleaning products. You can buy um, organizing bins and different things and still live in a cluttered and messy home. When we don't use something, it's useless. It's absolutely useless. With that in mind, I'm gonna invite you to join me when we look into the word of God and talk uh, and just hear for a moment from uh, the word of God in the story of Solomon. Check it out. It says this, the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and God asked, ask whatever you want me to give to you. Like, can you imagine that question? Ask whatever you want. Solomon answered, you have shown great uh, kindness to your servant, my father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a little child and I do not know how to carry out my duties. I mean, the the sweetness in this, I mean, Solomon's at his best here. He's like, look, I'm young. I don't get it. I don't know how to do what I'm supposed to do. And he goes on to say, your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or even to number. So, Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will have never been anyone like you, nor will there be anyone like you. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor. So God is gonna increase his wisdom and his ability to rule, but he's gonna provide him wealth and honor so that in your lifetime, you will have no king equal among the kings." 
And if you walk in obedience to me and you keep my decrees and commands as David, your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. So we look at this and understand what Solomon has done has has gotten for him a few different things. It's gotten him knowledge. It's gotten him ability. It's gotten him wealth and renown. He was a musician. Solomon was a musician. He was a builder. He built the ark. Um, the ark. What's wrong with me? He built the temple where the ark of God would be. And not only did he build the temple, he built his own palace. He was an expert governor. He was a scientist. Dude was a botanist. He would go and he would study plants. He was a zoologist. He wanted to see how animals worked. So he, he literally was one of the first scientists. He studied plants and zoology and different animals and different creatures. He was hungry for knowledge and he studied it. He was a poet. So he's all smart, but he also has a cool beard and can play the ukulele. You know, it's so good, right? I just love Solomon. Um, he was a shipping magnet. I love that. Like Solomon created a fleet and began international trade. He was a connoisseur. He understood the value of different spices and different things and brought into Israel a... Um, a higher palate, right? They weren't eating at McDonald's anymore. There was, a, there was a more refined palate. He was a connoisseur of things. He built the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, let me just walk you through a few, uh, just a quick list of things Solomon did. Check this out. He collected and composed thousands of proverbs and songs that were used in worship, over 3,000 proverbs and 1,000 songs. He did those. He established and developed trade links um, with other countries that led to prosperity in Israel. He is one of the first people we read about who uh, studied nature, plants, and animals so that they could understand them. He initiated industrial activities, exploited copper deposits in the area of Edom, which had also been conquered by his father, David. He developed diplomatic relations with foreign countries by marrying the daughters of the kings of those countries. So he married the daughters of the kings of Egypt, Moab, Edom, Tyre, and many other kings. He, may, he remained at peace with those countries. He built up a professional army and he equipped them with horse-drawn chariots. He had 1,400 chariots. You got to imagine this in terms of modern uh, mechanized warfare would be he had multiple um, dozens of divisions of, of armor, of tanks. That's what the, the chariots would have been in the ancient world. Um, so he had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen. So he had a huge cavalry. He had a government uh, whose officials uh, assisted him in his administrative duties. He kept his finger on the pulse of the country, but he had great people working with him. He was a wise man. He was able to judge in difficult cases. His wisdom is seen in the way he organized trade. The queen of Sheba, uh, Ethiopia, she came to learn from him and was smitten with all that he was. She was overwhelmed with it. Solomon, um, Solomon divided the, the kingdom into administrative kind of districts and different things so that they could um, maximize the, the natural resources that were there in Israel and do that effectively. He initiated an, an ambitious building program in Jerusalem. Now you have to remember, David moved into Jerusalem and it had been a small settlement. David made it the city of David. Solomon began fortifying that city. God gave Solomon everything that he promised and Solomon was as good as it gets. He was as successful, handsome, talented, smart, eloquent, um, engaging, charming, charismatic, everything you could be. And it leads me to this question. Why does Solomon then write these words at the end of his life. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Those are Solomon's words. So you have to ask the question, why is he talking this way? And what has happened? Because Solomon did some great things. And that scripture out of Ecclesiastes, which is a book written by Solomon at the end of his life, that's Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse two. And he's saying it's meaningless. Everything is pointless and meaningless. He did great things. But here's the thing that happened. There was a Trojan horse in the kingdom. 
There was a Trojan horse that had moved into his kingdom. And you may think like, wait a minute, Trojan horse, are we still? So um, the Iliad written by Homer. Uh, it's a poetry book. It's, it tells the story of the Trojan Wars um, where the brother of Agamemnon, I can't remember his name, but the brother of Agamemnon uh, had married a woman named Helen. And Helen was so beautiful, it is said of her that her face could launch a thousand ships, which I don't know if that's a compliment, you know, but, uh, but Helen of, of Troy was beautiful, but she wasn't originally of Troy. She was a Macedonian and um, Agamemnon, the king of the Greeks, um, when, when his brother's wife was taken by Paris, the son of the king of Troy, Agamemnon declares um, war on Troy. He declares war and they go up and they besiege Troy, but Troy's walls were too great and too thick and their fortifications too good that um, Agamemnon's Greeks couldn't break in and um, destroy the city. So they eventually pull their ships out, sail them around an isthmus there, and um, they built out of some of the ships, uh, they, they disassembled them and built a Trojan horse, a gift, an offering to the people of Troy. And they sent it up there. And a Trojan horse um, was, it basically had people in it, not enough men in it to... Um, not enough men to overtake the city, but enough men to unlock the gates and let the armies in. And that's what happened. If you read the Iliad, what happens is the Trojans see this gift from the Greeks and they're like, okay, and they bring it. It's huge, like it's massive. They wheel it into the city and they, they see it as, as this honor to the city of Troy. And they go to bed that night thinking they've been honored. And then um, outside of the horse, out of the horse crawl the Macedonian and um, Greek soldiers. And what do they do? They open the gates and the floodgates are open. And Troy is burned to the ground that night because there was um, a Trojan horse. There was something given to them. And when they let it in, they let in the thing that would be their own destruction. The Trojan horse was, um, it's a great metaphor for the life of Solomon. What did Solomon let into his life? What was Solomon's Trojan horse? I think that's a good question to ask. And I think it's very simple. Foreign wives. He allowed foreign wives into his life. And it's important that we look at this. Those foreign wives introduced him to foreign gods, to foreign practices. Solomon became an expert in everything. And, um, and I know we have um, young ears in the room, but I want you to understand this with me. Solomon did not distance himself from any pleasure so read into that, any pleasure at all. He, he had over 700 wives. That dude had two anniversaries a day every year. Think of that. Like that's unreal. He had 300 concubines. Solomon, he was an expert in everything. Everything. Even his relationships and workings with females. And those foreign wives got into his life and they cluttered his life. And what happens is when your life is too cluttered, well, the throne gets cluttered as well. Things get hidden. Things, um, think of the opening bumper, that video we show at the opening of the message. The kingdom begins to flourish. There's chests of gold. There's silver like gravel in the streets. There's prosperity and, and even the, the, the farming and everything's going great. Everything's going well. But after a while, all you see is the blessings, not the one who is, um, who is the, the giver of the gift. And I think it's important that we remember in Solomon's life, the throne was obscured. He only saw the, the immense amount of things he had, the pleasures, the knowledge, the wealth, all these things were right in front of him and the throne was obscured. And here's the thing, we do the same thing in our own life. We clutter our hearts with good things. This is the deception of the enemy that I think um, when we know that our enemy is wily and cunning, we need to remember this. The enemy of our soul will not clutter our lives with only bad things. He'll put really good things in there. There are things that are really good that we have in our life that have no place there because they clutter our lives. 
They remove from us the opportunity to live, um, live a life in, um, in obedience to God's calling. When your life is too cluttered, you can't even see the throne. You don't, what sits on the throne at that point is all that you have, all the possessions, all the things that you have. And here's the thing, when we clutter our hearts with good things as well as sinful behaviors, suddenly we don't even think about who's supposed to be on the throne of our life. We forget there is a throne in our life because it's filled to the brim with good things and some bad things. And, and we can't see, we don't remember. Remember what we talked about. Solomon had spoken with God in this dream. He had something that needed to be remembered. But the sad tragedy of this is that Solomon turns from the Lord. He turns from the Lord. The Trojan horse of his foreign wives turned his heart away. And this is what it says in 1 Kings 11, 1 to 13. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, the Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had, had said to the people of Israel. Now get this, this is back in the time of Moses. God said, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn your heart away after their gods. God had said that back in Moses' day. Solomon, remember Solomon is a, is a learned man. He knew he knew the commands of God, yet he married all those women. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord, his God, as was the heart of his father, David. For Solomon went after the Ashtoreths, the goddess of the Sidonians and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father has done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. Friends, these are, now we need to get this. This is crazy. He did this on the mountain east of Jerusalem, okay? But Molech and Chemosh are child sacrifice idols. His own offspring, Children of these women, they would offer them into the belly, the burning belly of Molech or Chemosh. So we know that Solomon is now participating with his own descendants in the abomination of child sacrifice. He built the places for his own children to be sacrificed because he loved many foreign wives. And so he did for all his foreign wives, it says, who made offerings and sacrifice to their God. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, two times, not just once. And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and I will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will take it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will. Give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. I mean, this is devastating. This is awful. God appeared to Solomon twice, twice. He had everything. He had wisdom, wealth, peace, success, fame, and it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Why wasn't enough? Because he stopped listening to his own advice. How, like, think about that. He was giving advice and wisdom to people and justice and, and he wasn't listening to his own words. He thought it was good for thee, but not for me, right? And when you see that in leaders and rulers, you know there's a corruption in that. Solomon quit listening to his own advice. What was his advice? He didn't fear the Lord anymore. Solomon had written the book of Proverbs. 
Solomon had written this. And in the very first chapter, he speaks on wisdom and folly. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. At the end of the first chapter, writing as wisdom itself, Solomon says this. Solomon pins a prophetic warning and it's a prophetic warning about his own life. Catch this. Oh my goodness. This is crazy. Like when you think that Solomon didn't, um, didn't understand this. It says this. Proverbs 1, 29 to 33. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away. I mean, this is crazy to me. And the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Fear God. Fear God. That's Solomon's counsel. Fear God. It's the beginning of wisdom. And wisdom is the font of life. What does this mean to fear God? Fear his power? Yes, absolutely it does. But it's more than that. It's an awe-filled respect for the office, the agency of who God is and what that entails and the grandeur and the beauty. It's an acknowledgement of his might, his love, his unbounding grace and goodness for us. But for all things, he is God. You will never become so wise that the fear of the Lord isn't the benchmark or the cornerstone of wisdom. You will never know so much that fearing God is not the first and most important choice. No matter how much you experience, study and learn that if you do it while ignoring God, you are entering into your own demise and you will not remain wise no matter how much you think you have it together. No matter how much you think God has blessed you, when you quit fearing God, you begin to cultivate, to build your own disaster and demise. If you start to ignore God because God's blessed you and you have much, I want to warn you, Solomon's prophecy fell on his own shoulders because he quit fearing God. If you look ahead into the, into the New Testament after the gospels and, the, and you're into the early epistles, there's a, an epistle written by the apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And in Romans 1, 21 and 22, it says this, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, that, but they became what? Futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 21 and 22 speaks of those who neither glorified God nor honored him as God. Their hearts became, their minds became futile and they became fools in their own behavior. This is a description of people who try to obtain wisdom while ignoring God while ignoring God's boundaries and his precepts and how God ordered things to be. And we need to look at it and recognize that it cannot be, we cannot um, lack in our fear of God when when we seek wisdom, because when we lack in the fear of God, the simple reality is this, since God is the, is the source of wisdom, fearing him is the entryway to gaining it not ignoring him, not letting the temple of our hearts be um, so full that we don't see the throne where God should sit. What do we do about that? Well, I would think this, we learn to abide. To abide in something means to make your home in it or, or it makes its place, its home in you. In your devotions this week, uh, on Saturday, there was a reading um, and, and it mentioned the book, The Screwtape Letters. And The Screwtape Letters were written by C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis um, wrote this book and, and it's from the perspective of an uncle and a nephew. And the uncle is a mentor to this nephew. And the uncle is named Wormwood and he's a demon. And, and his little nephew, uh, Screwtape, did I do it again? 
I think I always back these up. I think Wormwood is the nephew and screw tape because it's screw tapes letters. So I think that's the way it is. But the but the uncle is is giving instructions to his nephew on how to corrupt the life of this Christian, of this guy who's become a Christian. And he's given him this subtle advice on what to do. And it's really, it's a dark read, but it's really good. It's an inside look at evil. It, Honestly, I, I don't know how Lewis came up with it, but I, I just, when I read it, I'm like, man, it is so very true how it works. But this is some of the advice given to Wormwood by his uncle Screwtape. And he says it this way. Now, remember, we're talking about abiding. Abiding is when you make your home in something and it makes it home in its home in you. Check this quote out. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He thinks he's finding his place in it when really it's finding its place in him. Like, did, we are either abiding in this world and making it our everything, or we are abiding in Christ and making our home in him and him in us. There is no both in this. You can't have both and. We must abide in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, he used these own, his own words to teach us this. In John 15, he has a scripture in there. And, um, I could read through it, but you know it. And I'm going to paraphrase it because I think I like it. Um, I, I like these words from Jesus. And I like the way that he, he says it when he says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser, which means his father is the one who clips and prunes and does these things. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit will be, he takes it away. He's the vine dresser. He prunes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. But abide in me is what Jesus says. Abide in me and I will abide in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, they will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. When we look at this, uh, let's go all the way back to the beginning. What renders us useless? When we have something that is living and active and we don't employ it into our real life. We have wisdom and it's right here. Something is rendered useless for two reasons. You don't use it or you can't find it. You no longer have the courtesy of the second option. It's been found. Abide in Jesus Christ. What you now have is a choice to either use the wisdom of God and abide in Jesus Christ, or you can be apart from him and pretend that Jesus's words don't matter, that he, he'll, he'll be fine if you don't abide in him. I will tell you this, that we as the church need to... We need to reconcile our lives against wisdom. Is there room for Jesus Christ in our life? Not only that, is Jesus Christ the very room we make our life in? And we have to look at that and rec rec wrestle with it because the fact of the matter is, the gift of a relationship with Jesus Christ is to be woven into our very beings. It is, um, it is the thing that clears away our heart. We're not owned by everything else, by the prosperity. And we're a very prosperous nation and so many things are good. Even in hard times, we have more than, than anyone in history. It's amazing how much we have, but it often clutters the throne room of our heart and God clears it away. And it's the throne where Jesus Christ sits. The fear of the Lord is to be beginning of wisdom. Is the throne in your life too cluttered for you to remember that Jesus Christ belongs on the throne of your life? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And Jesus Christ said to us in his own words, abide in me, choose to make your life in me, and I will make my life in you. Church, the choice is yours. How now do you live with such a truth? Pray with me. God, thank you for who you are and the way that you work and you move and you speak. Our hearts are tender to you, God, because your heart has been tender to us. Your spirit has awoken us to respond in faith and gratitude and hope. So today we reach out with hands of faith and we ask that you would help us to see the clutter in our life. Forgive us, God, for loving the things of this world so much that we have filled our heart that we don't even remember there is a throne there that we like Solomon have so much that we forget what matters most. So may we hear the advice 
May we hear the counsel. May we respond in in faith and obedience to fear you and to clear our lives that our lives would be rooted in you and grown in you. Not a life where we just kind of have you as a trinket, but God, a life where you are, our all in all. God, may our hearts not be turned away by the love of this world and the many things in it. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.